Hey everybody, how we all doing today? Techie 101 back again here as always. Uh, Barry is still not here. He is on vacation, but hey, good news. He finally made it to Japan, all right? So here he is hanging out in front of Mount Fuji. Barry's worldwide tour continues. Where is he going to be next time? I don't know, but I'm still here making the videos, Barry, just letting you know. And it's actually a fantastic fall day to do a video because I finally get to wear my Devil Fruit sweatshirt. Yes. It's been so long. I've had this since I got it at Anime Expo. Uh, Briggs actually bought the same one, so I don't know if Briggs has ever worn this in a video or in like a stream or anything, but yeah, we have the same sweatshirt. Really cool design. We got the Bara Bara no Mi, the Yami Yami no Mi, the Mara Mara no Mi, and the uh, Op Op Fruit, and also we got the Gamu Gamu no Mi there. You know, you know the Gamu Gamu no Mi, air quotes, yeah. Oh, God. Oda really did kind of divide the fan base with that, right? So it's like all the One Piece fans that have yet to reach, like, chapter 1044, which is a good ways into the story, that just don't know. And then everybody else that is caught up with the manga that does know, all right? So from here on out, like, if you run into somebody that has, like, you know, not reached that point in One Piece yet, like, oh, hey, man, how's One Piece? Are you enjoying it? Oh, yeah, I just reached the Alabasta arc. Man, that's so cool. I love Luffy. Luffy's ability, the gum gum, the gum gum fruit, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, the gum gum fruit, yeah, it's a really good ability, I gotta say, yeah, it's just so cool, he could do so much stuff with just being rubber, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, right, he's just a rubber guy, that's all he's got in his arsenal, right, I just, like, I don't know, do we just play along, or whatever, okay, anyway, not talking about the gumu gumu no me today, I've talked enough about that, today we're gonna be talking about the newest arrangement of devil fruit abilities for Blackbeard's crew, and you know what, it's actually kind of interesting i wonder how long oda has actually been planning this because if you go back to like jaya when blackbeard's crew first made their introduction uh blackbeard at that point did have a devil fruit although we didn't know about it yet he did have the yami yami no me at that point but burgess did not have a devil fruit auger did not have a devil fruit uh lafitte was actually not with them during jaya because he was at marijua he does sort of have a devil fruit but we don't know like what it is exactly he he's able to turn into like I don't even know if he's able to turn into a pigeon, but he can, like, summon, like, pigeon wings. So some people have actually thought it's not even, like, a pigeon or, like, a bird fruit. It's actually, like, a mythical fruit of, like, an angel or something. Given the fact he was able to fly all the way up to, like, Marijua to, like, deliver the message to, like, Sengoku and everybody about Blackbeard. And that's how Blackbeard became a warlord, you know what I mean? So that's a whole other, you know, bag of worms when it comes to Lafitte, okay? But, like, a good chunk of Blackbeard's crew, and even after they got the level 6 prisoners out of Impel Down, did not have double fruits and I think that was the reason Oda was like I'm gonna introduce this cast of characters like the main principal villains of the One Piece world like eventually the Straw Hats are going to have to square up against these guys the Blackbeard crew and I'm gonna make a point to not give most of them devil fruits because I'm gonna have this whole plot at some point where they're gonna become a Yonko fleet go around and hunt for powerful devil fruits okay so essentially they can get like the fruits that best suit their personality and their own abilities beforehand you know what I mean because a a lot of times in the world of One Piece, whenever somebody eats a devil fruit, it's oftentimes by accident or by, like, a certain incident that, like, pushes them to eat the fruit. Now, in some cases, it's the perfect person that gets the perfect fruit for their ability. You can't look any further than uh, Law's op-op fruit in this regard. Yeah, Corazon kind of force-fed it to Law, but at the end of the day, it was, like, the best fruit Law could possibly have because he has, you know, um, training in, like, the medical field, and his dad was a doctor, and, he, like, a surgeon and everything, and, like, you can't really unlock the true power of the op op fruit unless you have those prior skills and so in some cases yes you do get you know users of a, of a fruit that like are perfectly suited for it but in other cases, in fact, I would say most of cases in One Piece, um, you know, it's just kind of like, oh, I ate this weird fruit and I got this weird power and it, it was strange and it didn't seem very strong at first, but I had to work for it. You know what I mean? That kind of bypasses everything with the Blackbeard crew where they are particularly hunting for strong devil fruit users and doing some process. I don't know if it involves just killing them right away because the whole thing with like when Blackbeard showed up at Amazon Lily, uh, they were talking about like killing Boa. And I think Blackbeard said something along the lines of like, well, you know, you don't kill her until we get what we want. So the idea is maybe he can like absorb the devil fruit power from them um, and then kill them afterwards. And then there was the whole thing with Whitebeard because Whitebeard was, well, Whitebeard might have been dead when he absorbed the Gura Gura or he might have just been like very close to death and then died anyway. Not really sure exactly how Blackbeard goes about stealing devil fruits, but he does have some mechanism that's pretty damn reliable because at this point now we have Van Auger with a devil fruit, Burgess with a devil fruit, Doc 
Q with a Devil Fruit. Doc Q's horse stronger with a Devil Fruit. Blackbeard himself has two, so let's count two there. Canarina Davon has a mythical. San Juan Wolf was confirmed to already have one. San Juan Wolf is a giant that has a Devil Fruit that makes him even more giant, so that's eight. Shiryu has one, so that's nine. Oh, then of course we have Lafitte, who, as I mentioned previously, has some kind of unidentified zone. It could be a pigeon zone, it could be an angel mythical zone, but he does have a Devil Fruit, so that's ten. Uh, which only leaves Avalo Pizarro and Vasco Shot, I believe, that are the only two members of the ten Titanic captains that are unconfirmed to have Devil Fruit abilities. Like I said, they probably do, though, given the fact that all the other captains have one, and uh, in the case with, like, even stronger, the horse, he has one. So, yeah, Vasco and Avaro also probably have Devil Fruits. We just don't know about them yet. Oda hasn't revealed them yet. So, yeah, even with that being said, though, if you exclude uh, Avalo and Vasco, we still have ten very powerful Devil Fruits that are part of Blackbeard's upper echelon that are really strong, like, you know, physical power and also support Devil Fruits that are, like, the best possible combination for the person that they were given to. And so we get four of them in this chapter we're going to go over today. Also, it's just kind of refreshing to get some new different fruits that aren't all zones. Stronger's fruit is a zone, but like coming out of Wano, I think we sort of got like exhausted from all the zone fruits. Am I right? Like it was really cool that we got all these dinosaur ancient zones and all these mythical zones and Kaido's a dragon and, and Yamato is a wolf deity and Luffy has the human human fruit model Nika and everything. It's just like there were so many. And then the smiles. There were so many zones throughout all of Wano. I will be okay if Oda does not reveal another zone fruit for quite some time, okay? With, like, the dozens of zone fruits. If you include the smile users, literally dozens of zone fruits that we got in Wano, and there really wasn't a lot of other unique devil fruits, right? Um, we did have Aramaki's, who is, you know, has the Logia. He's the admiral that has the forest forest fruit, so that was kind of a breath of fresh air. But uh, before Aramaki, man, it was just, like, nothing but zones for, like, a good four years in this story, okay? But anyway, let's get to the new lineup of devil fruits for uh, Blackbeard's crew. You know, let's start off with probably the most basic out of all of them, and there were even some comments in the review that were even saying that this devil fruit is boring, and it's not very creative, and Oda ran out of ideas, and that is Jesus Burgess's Riki Riki no Mi, or the strength strength fruit, or the buff buff fruit. Oh yeah, I'm buff! I should have gotten those, like, fake muscles. I should have I should have ordered anchor arms for this video. You know, and <laughs> just put them under the sweatshirt and just be like, yeah! All right. So, uh, Burgess, of course, is uh, the captain of the first fleet of Blackbeard's crew. He's the helmsman of the original ship, okay? Which, by the way, a lot of people were commenting, now that Burgess is this big, muscular luchador that is the helmsman, people are really thinking he's going to square up with Jean Bay now. And I can definitely see it. Because, you know, there's some of the Blackbeard crew that are like an easy one-to-one -one. like obviously Van Auger the sniper is going to fight against Usopp the sniper obviously Shiryu the swordsman is gonna fight against Zoro right obviously um but Burgess actually makes a lot more sense now to fight Jinbei than like Sanji or anybody else because of just Burgess's like role on the crew or his initial role on the crew and now he's like he's super strength and all that stuff right so like Jinbei's like discipline and fishman karate and jujitsu that would be really good okay or jujutsu jujitsu Jujutsu. One of them is like the that manga that everyone tells me to read that I haven't gotten that far into, and the other one's a martial arts discipline. Whichever, however. Okay. Anyway, yes, Burgess does have a very simple paramecia. All it does is make him very, very strong. It's the super strength fruit, and I mentioned this in the review that it's just kind of weird that when you think of all these like simple, um, you know, special abilities or superpowers in like comic books or manga, the the first ones you're going to think of are like the Justice League basic set, you know, like, you know, the Flash has super speed, Superman has super strength, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? You'd think that the simple abilities would be utilized first, okay? And a lot of other manga, that's even the case. I mean, look at Hunter x Hunter. One of the first prominent Nen users when Nen started becoming, you know, actually introduced into the story, we got the Phantom Troop, and we had um, uh, Uvogin. Uvogin's whole Nen ability, he was just an enhancer that just punched things really hard. That was pretty much it, right? So you'd go through, like, the simple abilities first, but not with Oda. With Oda, it takes 1,063 chapters to get to the fruit that just gives you super strength, okay? And, you know, when some people said this was sort of like a, a boring concept, I mean... I mean, you're not wrong, but, like, just because it's boring or not very original, because the idea, the concept of super strength has been around for literally thousands and thousands of years, I would argue 
it was probably one of the first concepts of a superpower. Because, like, imagine back, like, you know, tens of thousands of years ago when, like, we don't even have civilization yet. And we're just, like, a bunch of hunter-gatherers out in the woods or whatever. I I'm sure, like, our ancestors at that point were probably thinking to themselves, like, when language first started coming around, like, Hey, Ugg, wouldn't it be really cool if, like, you know, you had the ability to lift logs with, like, one hand? That would be really useful. You could, like, build houses faster. It's like, yeah, Ugg, that would be interesting. Well... Too bad, no one's that strong, right? It was probably like one of the first concepts. Like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could run like really, really, really fast and then like, grab the gazelle? I'm like, yeah, then we could eat faster. I'm like, yeah. You know, it's like, it's probably one of the first ideas for like a superpower, right? But that doesn't make it any more terrifying. Burgess was already built like a brick shit house, and now he's just like, oh, wait, I'm even stronger now. Now, here's the big question. When did he eat this fruit, okay? I would say it was obviously after or during the time skip, okay? He obviously did not have this fruit back, you know, pre-time skip when we first got introduced to the Blackbeard crew. I think that could pretty much be just summarized with his bounty. His bounty back then was only 20 million, which aside from Blackbeard himself, who only had a bounty of zero, uh, you know, doesn't really count. Uh, he had the lowest bounty out of all of the original members of Blackbeard's crew. Uh, Augers was like 60 something million. I know Doc Hughes was 72 million and Lafitte's was like 43.4 million or something like that. OK, so Burgess was only 20 million. So I don't think if he was like that ridiculously strong back then with like a devil fruit power, his bounty would have been that low. Also, there was the scene when he fought against Ace very briefly briefly and he chucked the hotel at Ace. Ace just burned it up and Blackbeard was like, you know, Burgess, you're too weak to be fighting that guy yet at his level, you know? So I, like, the idea is, yeah, he didn't get that fruit until later. But here's the question. Did Burgess get the fruit before Dressrosa or after Dressrosa? All right? Because... Either way, this is terrifying, all right? Now, I even looked it up on the wiki, and it, because there's an implication in the chapter when Law was fighting against all of them. Law, like, thinks to himself of, like, oh, man, they've been hunting very powerful devil fruits, okay? They got super strength, a teleporting ability, a sickness ability, and now this, this horse has, like, a mythical zone, right? So the implication was that Law mentioned that all of these devil fruits were recently acquired by Blackbeard's, like, crewmates and stuff, like the Ten Titanic Captains. Although Blackbeard, I mean, Law wouldn't know exactly when Blackbeard's crew got these powers, okay? Uh, maybe if Law had a previous run-in with Blackbeard's crew, like, maybe, you know, after Dress, well, no, no obviously not after Dressrosa, because that was when he was traveling with the Straw Hats. So, yeah, Law would not know. Law is just like, oh, they probably got these fruits recently, but he wouldn't know exactly when. Now, I'm under the opinion that Burgess had this fruit prior to Dressrosa, okay? Because if you go back and you look at the damage that Burgess is levying at the Corridia Coliseum at Dressrosa when he was uh, Mr. Store, you know, he was the gladiator in the arena, he had two attacks that were named Hotto Elbow and the Galleon Lariat. There was another one called Champion Driver, awesome name, but that was non-canon, okay? But both of these canon abilities, the Hotto Elbow and the Galleon Lariat, are, like, able to, like, like, he used the, uh, the Hotto Elbow in the arena, and, like, boom, Hotto Elbow, I believe he used it against Sabo, and, like, Sabo blocked it with hockey and, like, his Dragon Claw, and then, the, but the shockwave from this thing, like, boom, like, blasted out half of the damn arena, okay? And then he used Galleon Lariat later, I think that was able to, like, slice multiple buildings in half, just, Galleon Lariat, weep! Oh, and, like, half the freaking town is getting blown to pieces, okay? And also, just, like, here's Burgess pre-time skip, here's Burgess post-time skip, okay? Like, I get it, it's anime, like, Zoro got a lot more buff as well, but, like, Literally, Burgess was, like, built, like, like really top-heavy and everything. Now he's built, like, you know, the Hulk, okay? Like, he's really big right now, all right? So I'm under the impression that they found this fruit sometime during the time skip, and uh, Burgess ate the thing prior to competing at the Cordia Coliseum. And you could still have the thing where, like, he wasn't even using his full power, because in the last chapter, we saw him casually, like, lifting up mountains. Like, it wasn't even that big of a deal. And so the whole point of Burgess being being at Dressrosa was to get the Mara Maranomi, so he probably had to, like, play by the rules of the Coliseum. He couldn't just... I, I feel like if he did have the Riki Riki Nomi during Dressrosa, Burgess could have, like, punched the ground once in, like, in Baki fashion, and the entire Coliseum would have just been, like, completely blown apart, blown apart, you know what I mean? 
he he probably could have done that, I guess. But, you know, he's a luchador. Like, that's the whole thing. He wears the mask. He wants to have a fight and everything like that. But he's this big, giant, bulky guy, and he's, like, levying so much damage. So even if you want to say, though, that he did not have the power of the Riki Riki no Mi at Dressrosa, he didn't get that until after Dressrosa. Oh, <laughs> okay. So he was able to use the Hotto Elbow Galleon Larry, and he was able to, like, destroy part of the Coliseum and buildings without a Devil Fruit power. And now he he has one that makes him even more powerful. So, okay, in that regards, then it doesn't matter. He's terrifying no matter what. Pre-time skip, he was already able to lift up a two-story hotel and then overhand it at freaking Ace's head. Okay, he, you know, try to do that. Try to go outside and lift up a hotel. It's not easy. I tried it, you know what I mean? It's pretty hard. You know, hotel, your standard hotel is, is uh, pretty heavy. It would require, I would say, at least 10,000 Riki Rikis of force in order to lift Lift up a hotel, okay? And uh, yeah, he was able to do that beforehand, okay? So yeah, Burgess. Burgess is not, like, all of the abilities in One Piece don't need to be, like, complex Nen abilities or mythical zones with, like, a bunch of different, like, extra powers on top of them. Like, Kaido could turn into a dragon, and he could fire laser beams, and he can also fire wind blades, and he can also fire lightning, and he can also do this, he can also turn into a duck. You know, not all Devil Fruits need to have that, okay? Burgess is a... I, I wouldn't call him stupid, clearly not the most intelligent member of the crew. He's like the guy that charges in and just, he's the bulldozer, he's the tank, okay? That's Burgess's role, and he knows his role, okay? Get it? Because he's a wrestler, he's like, know your role! Yeah, okay, anyway, so, um, yeah, I get it, though, I get it, like, he's just a tank guy, he's just like, I'm super buff, I'm gonna run into you, punch you, and you and everything standing behind you is going to be knocked down and probably just obliterated, okay, you know, Burgess, obliterate, you know, that's his role, that's what he does, and he's going to carry it out. Also, something else about Burgess that I, I missed in the chapter, he has, like, a metal, like, plate on his head now, which may very well be from when he fought Sabo, I'm not really sure. Sure, although Sabo did take his Dragon Claw and like crush Burgess's skull with it at one point. So that might actually be from Sabo. He might actually have some dents in his skull that he had to have patched up, you know, and everything like that. So, um, you know, it, it's one piece. You know, you just like attach some metal plates to someone's head. He's like, all right, we, I'm back again, right? Maybe he lost a few brain cells, but like I said, he wasn't the most intelligent guy anyway, okay? But yeah. Um, pretty simple ability, but damn is it strong. Uh, he could do a lot of stuff with this, and, uh, oh, it's also very similar to Aruj's Devil Fruit, although we don't know the name of Aruj's power yet. I feel like Aruj's Devil Fruit, the, like, the retribution ability, that's when he, like, um, you know, takes a certain amount of damage. He can then convert that damage into his physical strength, okay? So if Aruj gets punched by Kaido and he doesn't die, Aruj could get back up and he could channel the energy of Kaido's punch into his own muscles, okay? But with the case with Burgess, he's just super buff already, okay? And I don't know if this is a thing where the more he trains, the stronger and stronger he stronger he gets with this, like, boost. Um, but he's able to just casually lift up and throw mountains at this point. Like, it's not even that big of a deal for him, so I don't even think in the last chapter we saw Burgess's, like, upper limit of what he could really pick up. Burgess at the end of the series, he's just gonna pick up a chunk of the red line. He's gonna grab the moon and just throw it at Jinbei, and then Jinbei's like, you know, fish Man Karate, Ogi, you know, moon devastation, and like, Jinbei punches the moon and it shatters into a million pieces. Man, it's gonna be a crazy ass fight. That is gonna be, a, if, if, okay, if Jinbei does end up fighting against Burgess at the end of the story, that is gonna be a straight up Dragon Ball Z fight. Like, re like without the laser blast, but that's all, oh my god, it's gonna be insane. Alright, but that was, that was Jesus Burgess. Uh, moving on now to easily my favorite Devil Fruit out of all of them that were revealed, uh, Van Auger, Supersonic Van Auger's Warp Warp Fruit. Okay, so this is the teleportation Devil Fruit that I've been waiting for since the beginning of the story. Once again, a very simple uh, superpower. It's very prevalent in a lot of anime, the ability to teleport places, okay? We've kind of already seen this with the Op Op Fruit, although that is a limited form of teleportation, where Law basically can only teleport within a set distance around him. He has to open a room room up first, and the size of the room varies. Um, he can make it the size of, like, mountains, but when he does that, it greatly reduces his lifespan, so he can't be throwing up rooms the size of, like, islands very often. Although, if push comes to shove, he could do it. Um, but the Warp Warp Fruit, I'm imagining, is probably, like, the true teleportation fruit that does not, you know, there, there's no uh, downside like that. Like, the, the focus of the ability, there's really not a lot of battle applications, like, it doesn't make you stronger, it doesn't hurt your opponent, but, like, 
the supplemental aspects of this are immense. So in the last chapter, all Augur did was use it to teleport Burgess from the ship onto the island that Law's crew had arrived at. So Burgess was already on the island and he brought a welcoming dish of a giant mountain that he then, you know, threw at Law's crew. Um, now we don't exactly know how Van Augur teleported Burgess because it was like kind of like Burgess was just there and then Augur was like, I'm going to teleport you to that island, Burgess. And he's like, okay. And then it was just blip and then boop and then he's this there. Um, I would assume that Augur would easily be able to teleport himself wherever he wanted to go. That's kind of the point of the fruit. Uh, maybe he has to come into direct contact. Like he has to go over and touch Burgess to actually warp him somewhere else. Um, what's the limits with this teleportation? Can Augur just teleport anybody anywhere? I would imagine no. I would imagine he can't just teleport somebody to a location that he doesn't know about, because uh, if that was the case, it's like, okay, we'll just teleport everybody to Laugh Tail. Boop, and then there you go. Although... It's interesting because there, there's a few limitations with this, like you could go with. Like maybe it's a place he's already been before or he has to physically see. So they've already been to Jaya, for instance. So would Augur be able to teleport the crew back to Jaya because he's already been there? Uh, maybe. Uh, because the island was right there. It's implied that Blackbeard's crew had never been to that island before. It was just a random island in the new world that uh, Law's crew had to dock at. So it might have been a situation where it's like, oh, I see the island. Okay, if it's within eye shot and also, he's a sniper. He can see very, very far away. He has a gun. He has the um, Senriku, or not, yeah, Senriku, which is a thousand lands, and that's his, like, sniper rifle's name, okay? So if he has, like, the scope, and he can, like, he can snipe birds from, like, several, several kilometers away. So if it's anything in his sight, then it's still a really overpowered fruit, because he has some of, like, the best vision in the entire story, right? But let's assume it's even greater than that. Let's assume it's anywhere he can see, he can teleport you to, and any place that he's already been before, very, very, very useful. So even if the crew has never, and this might be how the crew rounds up all of the road poneglyphs, right? Because let's say Blackbeard finds out one of the road poneglyphs is on Zoe, and it's like they don't know where Zoe is, but if they figure out its general location or like an island they've already been to, they're like, boop! It's like, is, is Zoe here? Nope, okay, let's warp over there. Boop! Is Zoe there? Nope, let's warp over there. Boop! I found it! Okay! And then if, if Augur ever sees Zunisha within eyesight, he could just just warp to the top like this is such a broken ability so much of the one piece world i don't know if you knew this is covered in ocean and that greatly reduces uh travel also the weather because the weather in the grand line especially is so dangerous so it's like it's so dangerous to get into this place it's the pirate graveyard you have to sail from island to island you might die on the way there um with this fruit you just circumvent all of that you just like i can go pretty much anywhere i want which is why it's such a great ability for van auger i don't think it's so broken that you can go anywhere you want without even knowing where the like like you know how would it even work with going to laugh tail because they have no concept of where laugh tail is what it even looks like you know they have no idea you know i don't think auger can just be like um i teleport to laugh tail Boop! and then he just shows up there he's like oh i'm here okay uh captain you know come on over you know i don't think there's anything like that that they could do um but if he's maybe if they look at a map what if it's like a map where it's like okay here's an island charted on a map i know the general region of the world it's in i have the latitude and longitude or whatever the one piece equivalent of that is. I know the general direction of where it is and everything like that. Uh, it could be a thing where it's like, hey, there is an island that's uh, exactly 527 kilometers north-northeast of our current location. And then Augur might be able to like, okay, I will teleport you 527 kilometers north by northeast of this location. Boop, and then I'm on the island. It could be something like that where it, it's judged by distance, even if it's not in uh, eye line of him, okay? So... Like, I'm sure Oda's gonna, like, add some limitations to this, but even without those limitations, just the, uh, the ability of him being a sniper, he could be, at, like, on top of a mountain and snipe you and just warp and then to like the, to the other side of the mountain or like another peak or something and like snipe you from that location like auger could literally fire like seven because how fast he is already and he's like such a great uh you know shot he could literally fire like three or four bullets like warping from each cardinal direction like north south east west <sighs> Oh, I'm dead. And you get, like, shot from the head from four different angles. Like, it could be something like that that he could do. Really powerful ability there. Um, yeah, and I think he can teleport other people as long as he comes into, like, direct contact with them. He could probably teleport objects. He could probably teleport ships and everything like that. Like, this is the fruit I've been waiting for. Like, this would have been my devil fruit if I could get something. Like, this is the teleportation fruit, you know? I feel like having lunch in Paris today. Whoop, I'm in Paris. Now I feel like touring, um, I don't know, Ang 
Angkor Wat over in Cambodia. Boop, and now I feel like looking at the area where they filmed Lord of the Rings in New Zealand. Boop, and now I feel like having a nice dinner in Hawaii. Boop, and then just keep doing that. Like, that's, that's my dream ability. Like, it would be so cool to do that. You don't have to worry about airplane travel. I get motion sickness really bad, so that's the main reason why I would want a teleportation fruit. Um, but yeah, Van Auger, uh, very powerful fruit. Out of all of the ones that were introduced, I mean, Doc Hughes is pretty powerful as well, but just in terms of the sheer range of augers, yeah, this, this might be the strongest one we got to see in the last chapter. Um, let's talk about Strongers really quick because there's not that much to discuss about it. Stronger is a horse, so Stronger doesn't talk very much. Um, Stronger has the power of the mythical horse horse fruit model Pegasus. Pegasus being the mythical horse with wings. So on the surface, it pretty much just allows um, Stronger to fly, and that's the only application we really saw it in the last uh, chapter. Um, I do have this big ugh, mythology book over here. And uh, this is like the story of the Pegasus's like creation or birth. So the Pegasus was actually created by Medusa. See Medusa here, one of the Gorgon sisters. Also, I love the depictions of Medusa because sometimes the depictions of Medusa, she's like this uh, monstrous creature, like in the Ray Harryhausen stop motion movie. You know, she's like this snake lady that's like very monstrous. And in other versions, she's like very beautiful. And then in other versions, she's like a true monster, but she can become like put on like a glamour or like a visage of her being beautiful like luring men into her lair or whatever and but the whole idea is you know hair of snakes turning to stone same basic idea and uh when perseus showed up and lopped off her head out of her uh you know out of her wound of her neck came pegasus and also a warrior a grown human warrior named uh chrysor chrysor i've never heard of this guy before but um yeah and they were children of poseidon that were created through medusa okay so yeah, very interesting. Also, other tie-in with this story, uh, this is more of just geography and mythology, but um, as a tie-in with that, after Perseus kills Medusa and takes her head, uh, he's like flying away on his magic sandals, and he's going over the uh, northern African desert, and uh, he travels uh, where Atlas was, and so Atlas is like holding up, he's the, t the titan that's forced to like hold up the sky, and so uh, he wants to rest because Perseus just killed, you know, the, the Medusa, and he just wants to chill out for a bit, and Atlas won't let him him land because Atlas received like uh, uh, a word from an oracle a long time ago like you're gonna be screwed over and uh, robbed by one of Zeus's kids and I don't know if this is before or after the whole thing with Heracles and the golden apples or whatever and I think it actually has to be anyway Atlas is done dealing with Zeus's kids all right that's basically the point he already had to deal with Heracles and the apples and now he has to deal with Perseus showing up and so Atlas is like no I'm not letting you land here I'm not letting you deal with this and so Perseus takes out uh, Medusa's head and turns Atlas Atlas into stone, and that's the creation of the Atlas Mountains, which exist in northwestern Africa right now. Although back then, that whole region of Africa, remember, was just called Libya. Um by the Greeks at that time. Okay, but that's where the Atlas Mountains stand today, and that's the origin of them. So, well, not the actual geographical origin of them, but, you know, that's that's the origin of the name. Okay, anyway. So, uh, yeah, that, that's the birth of uh, Perse uh, Pegasus by Perseus slaying the uh, Medusa. Um, often referred to as a horse deity. A lot of mythical zones give you special abilities on top of the ability to turn into the mythical animal. I would imagine the ability to turn into the mythical animal of Pegasus gives you the ability to fly already. I don't think that's the special ability. So Stronger might have some other ability that we don't know about yet. Uh, I actually have to do a lot more research into the Pegasus to really find out. But um, out of all of them, I think it's just the fruit that's like, hey, Stronger is a horse, so we'll give him the mythical horse fruit. There you go, it fits. And so Stronger can fly now, which is a useful power. But, you know, at the same time, Augur can teleport. Lafitte was already able to fly. You know, so the ability to fly alone is useful, but not like the end-all, be-all ability. You know what I mean? Uh, and there's a lot of other Devil Fruits that we've already been revealed, most of them in Wano, that give the ability to fly in some way. So yeah, that's stronger. And then finally, we have Doc Q's Devil Fruit, which is the Sick Sick Fruit. It's also important to mention we didn't get the re uh, revelation of any of these being uh, Paramecia or whatever. I'm assuming the, other than Stronger's obviously being a zone, Burgess's, Augur's, and Doc Q's are all um, Paramecia class. Um, it's possible that maybe out of all of them, Doc Q might have a Logia because he can like turn into like like the element of disease, I guess, which might be considered an element, who knows, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it's a Paramecia. And he's able to afflict 
illnesses on others. And the only way we saw him use this was the, um, the ability to, uh, I'll turn you into a woman disease that he used against a heart pirates crew, okay, to make them flip their sex. Okay, so Law became a woman, and Beppo became a woman. And we actually don't know if it worked on Ikaku, because Ikaku's the only woman on the heart pirate crew, so maybe she became a man. Not really sure. However, Law was able to fight back using his hockey, and all of the crew turned back into their original sex, okay? So, that seemed to be more of just, like, a joke on Doc Q's part, though. Like, he wasn't super serious. You can just imagine, like, the level of damage you could rot with this, okay? Like, just all of the diseases, not even the diseases that exist in our world that are horrible, you know, like tuberculosis or something, um, but just all of the horrible diseases that exist in the One Piece world, which I think it, it might actually be, I think, what Oda's gonna go with. Maybe not to so much draw conclusions to our world. Like, um, I made the reference in the review of, like, what happens, could, could Doc Q, like, give you, like, uh, cancer or something? And there was a lot of people that actually responded, like, ah, maybe not because cancer kind of works differently. It's like cells that like at rapidly multiply. It's, it's not the same kind of, it is a disease, but it's not the same kind of disease as like the flu or something like that. You know what I mean? So let, let's take cancer off the table. I don't think Oda would do that anyway. I don't think Oda would like write a character like, I can give you cancer. I mean, I, that might hit a little bit too close to home for a lot of people. You know, I think we've all had people that have died from cancer. So I don't think Oda would put that in his, in his manga. So he might just create a bunch of really crazy illness in the One Piece world, like, you know, a, a fever that really just, like, burns you out, like, literally lights you on fire, which might have been something that, like, you know, a character's had before. That actually kind of rings a bell, a fever that makes you so, like, hot. It, like, lights you on fire or something like that. So really crazy, ridiculous, like, um, you know, anime diseases that he might have, you know, Doc Q hand out. Still very bad, very bad diseases. He might have a disease that makes you, like, not be able to breathe air or something, you know, just like, <gasps> you know, it was like, yeah, something like that. And then, yeah, you're not gonna last long after that. Uh, but yeah, something else in the review I really wanted to talk about revolving around Doc Q's ability uh, was the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. I'm actually really kicking myself that I didn't get a chance to talk about that in the review. And I've mentioned it before when we talk about Doc Q, but you have the Four Horsemen, right? So, um, and it changes throughout history. Like, for a long time, the White Horse was actually regarded as just a conquest. But in other versions of the story, the White Horse actually becomes, like, the Antichrist in some of the stories. And that's actually because of Napoleon's conquest of, you know, like, France and everything like that in the surrounding areas during the time when he was around. And he rode a White Horse. So, these, these symbols change throughout history just to let you know but typically the white horse is ridden by the horsemen of pestilence or conquest and carries a bow the red horse is most almost always war now you might say what's the difference between conquest and war it sort of like is conquest is like war, I guess, through like conquest, like your entire nation, like, you know, spreading out and taking over other lands for your kingdom or whatever. Whereas the red horse uh, represents like civil war, like inside. And this is actually something that ties back to the splitting of like the Roman Empire. So there's that. Um, the uh, rider of the red horse of war carries a sword. Okay. And then we have the black horse that represents famine that carries scales. So famine, pretty self-explanatory there, like, yeah. And then finally we have the pale horse ridden by death, also accompanied by Hades himself, and death carries a scythe. Okay, so we have Doc Q riding on a pale horse, stronger, and in addition to that, during Marineford, when we saw Doc Q fighting against uh, Whitebeard, like, all dealing damage to Whitebeard, he was using a scythe, okay? And so it seems very clear from all of that that Oda is, like, referencing um, the rider of the pale horse, uh, you know, the death uh, uh, aspect of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse with Doc Q, okay? And so the fact that he has the sick, sick fruit, he could probably deal out a disease that could kill you, like, his most dangerous disease could potentially kill you, although law has shown that, like, as long as you have powerful hockey you can resist um yeah oh by the way I, I should bring this up now a lot of people are really concerned about law's crew not so much for law himself but because they seem to think that law's crew is overall very weak like beppo sachi penguin and jean bart are the strongest members of law's crew and even they are not really all that powerful. Um, they didn't really do anything during, like, Wano. We didn't see, like, Beppo take on one of the Toby Ropo or Jean Bart, like, wrestle with Jack or anything like that. Um, they were really just taking care of, like, the waiters and the pleasures and the lower-ranked members. So people have started to think that, like, oh, Law's going to lose this one because Law is easily the strongest, like, by leaps and bounds stronger than every other member of his crew, and the rest of his crew really don't have the strength necessary to deal with Blackbeard's crew with all these powerful devil fruits and everything. I would just say to that that it is true. We really haven't seen Sachi and Penguin or Beppo or Jean Bart do anything crazy in terms of feats yet. However, I will say 
Beppo still has his Sulong, which we have yet to see, so let's not count Beppo out yet. Sachi and Penguin have been with Law ever since, you know, that's how the crew began, really. If you read the Law light novel, it's like a whole thing with that. Um, Sachi and Penguin, though, they don't have Devil Fruit powers, uh, but they work together really well. And then Jean Bart is really strong, so maybe we might learn more about him. Um, and all the other members of the crew, we, we really don't know anything about. Although I will also mention that in the anime, Law has Panda Man on his crew. So as long as Law has Panda Panda Man, even if Law were to fall, Panda Man, st oh my god, that would be the greatest, that would be the greatest moment where you think, oh man, Law's crew is so weak, they're gonna die, you know, they're just gonna get massacred by Blackbeard and everything like that, and then in the next chapter, Law's on the ground, he's beaten, he's down, Sachi, Penguin, Beppo, they're all defeated, Jean Bart's down, and then it's like Blackbeard's like, say ha ha, now I'll take the op-op fruit for myself, and then out of the dust, steps out Panda Man wearing the, the boiler suit of the Law Pirates, of the Law Pirates, the Heart Pirates, and he rips off the boiler suit, and he, like, swells up even more muscular than Burgess, and he's like, it looks like it's time for, you know, me to show off my true power, and then Panda Man, like, one-punches freaking Burgess. It's like Saitama in the One Piece world. Yeah, so don't, don't count Law's crew out yet. All right, no, you know, t stepping aside from, you know, Panda Man intervening. Um... I think, you know, they managed to make it pretty far into the new world, you know what I mean? Like, they have to have some level of combat expertise, you know? They can't just be like, I'm a random person from the South Blue, and I'm just gonna join up on the Law... I keep saying the Law Pirates. I mean, it, part of me feels like it should have just been called the Law Pirates, but the Heart Pirates. It's like some random dude from the South Blue, like, I have a dagger, and I'm going to fight! Woo! And then he gets one-shotted by, like, Augur or somebody. Like, I feel like they have to have a certain level of strength, so we'll see where it goes but yeah uh if your hockey is not strong enough to prevent it because hockey's becoming and i made a video about that like a couple days ago about how hockey can prevent you from like you know getting these actual illnesses that doc q is, is dealing out so yeah it's pretty dangerous and also the idea that it's infectious diseases that he controls where it's like one person gets the disease spreads it to everybody else if those people in question don't have strong enough hockey they're just screwed you know what I mean? Like, Doc Q could release some kind of illness that could kill you, spreads to everybody. He could wipe out entire towns within a matter of, like, minutes, maybe. Okay, depending on how potent these diseases are, okay? So, out of all of them, I would say probably Doc Q's might be the strongest in terms of application and just widespread death. So, yeah, and then Augur's teleportation fruit, really powerful, and then Burgess's just raw physical strength just to, like, beat people down and lift up mountains. That's really powerful. And then Stronger's Pegasus fruit. Although, to be fair, they're all really powerful, all right? And like I said, we already have Katarina Davon has the mythical um, Kitsune fruit. Um, San Juan Wolf has the giant fruit. Uh, we had uh, Vala Pizarro and Vasco Shot. We don't know their fruits yet, although they probably have one. Shiryu has the clear, clear fruit that they got from Absalom. And of course, Blackbeard has the Guru Guru no Mi, Wipers fruit, and the Yami Yami no Mi, the darkness fruit. Okay. And so we don't know who the 10th Titanic captain is, although I guess it could have been Stronger. Stronger was the 10th Titanic captain the whole time, although I don't think it makes sense because Stronger's not like a mink or anything. Anything. Stronger is just like a regular ass horse that has a devil fruit power. That's it. Stronger does not seem to have very keen like, you know, tactics, battle, like organization sort of like capacity. Stronger is a horse, okay, and a very sick horse at that. Which also brings another question, like, did Doc Q always have this Devil Fruit? I feel like if any of the members of Blackbeard's crew might have had theirs beforehand, pre-time skip, Doc Q's might have had his. Because his bounty was always very high, and he was always very sick. So, I don't think this is the case. I Maybe his bounty would have been high, because even if he didn't have the fruit, he was already sickly, going around town handing out exploding apples, so that might have been dangerous enough to give him. But a 72 million berry bounty, pre time skip like that's like kind of like by the standards of him like not even joining the blackbeard crew yet like they had those bounties beforehand that's pretty damn high back then by those standards okay so i think maybe doc q might have always had that fruit all right and then burgess got his post time skip auger definitely got his post time skip um and then most of the other devil fruits that the blackbeard crew had they they got later but i could see doc q always having his anyway that's the video. Oh, we got one more installment of Monkey Facts. We'll get to that. But uh, anyway, yeah, thanks for watching, everybody. And like I said, I could have kept going and going with the Monkey Facts. There's so many different species, but we got to stop it at this one, one point. And I want to get to Narwhal Facts, so let's go. You got the funky monkey facts.
right, so with the last episode of Monkey Facts, we have the um, Northern Plains Langur, uh, L-A-N-G-U-R, Langur. I guess that's how it's pronounced. Also referred to as the Sacred Langur uh, because it is a monkey that is regarded as a sacred animal in the Hindu religion. And for that reason, and the reason I'm covering it, is because out of all the monkeys we've covered, so many of them are like very close to being uh, extinct or like they're very critically endangered right now. Well, because of its sacred status in the Hindu religion, the, uh, the gray Langur or the uh, Sacred Langur has least concern right now. So it's doing okay. Although it still has to deal with like just in general like habitat loss you know human beings you know building cities and stuff kind of you know indirectly cause it some strife but it's not like directly being hunted although sometimes they are hunted but not very often because of their status okay um they're a relatively small monkey they're only about 17 to 30 inches in length however their tails are way longer than their body length okay so the tail can be upwards of 44 inches in length so it's even like close to like you know if it's the monkey that's like you know let's say it's a smaller monkey 17 inches. Well, I guess the tail might not be 44 inches in that regard, but like still really long tails on these monkeys, okay? Um, and yeah, they're very, very adaptable also, which may also lend to their like status being least concerned right now because they mostly live in like dry forests and shrublands and they're just very highly adaptable. That plus their sacred status, they're doing okay. In some cases, uh, people of India actually even uh, give them funerals whenever they find like a dead uh, sacred langur on the side of the road or something. They will actually give the monkey a proper funeral because of their status. Okay, so yeah, those, those monkeys are doing okay right now in the world. But anyway, those were monkey facts. Hope you all enjoyed. And now next time, we're going with narwhal facts. Narwhal, narwhal, swimming in the ocean, causing a commotion because they are so awesome. Narwhal, 